Good evening, everyone. Good evening, my name is Zia Khan. I'm the Vice President for Initiatives and Strategy at the Rockefeller Foundation, and it's my great honor to moderate this uh, illustrious panel on this very fascinating topic, uh, which is, should business lead the social agenda? And just as a reminder, part of the spirit of this open forum is for those of us who have been in lots of uh, discussions in Davos to engage with a broader range of uh, people and opinions on some of the issues that we're talking about at Davos. So the spirit of this is very much meant to be interactive. We'll have a little bit of discussion up front and then I'll soon open it up to the floor for some questions. Uh, so first, let me introduce, uh, by name and organization, my uh, very distinguished panelists. And I, I think the range of perspectives that we have here will make for a very interesting discussion. So first, sitting right to my right, is Dr. Dananjan Shrizen Kanjara, and he is the Secretary General of Civicus. Sitting right next to him, is Dr. Ashifi Gogo, who is the CEO of Sproxel. Next to him is Mr. Paul Balki, the CEO of Nestle. Further to the left, Mr. Feiki Sebesna, who is the CEO of DSM. And then furthest to the left is the Right Honorable Helen Clark, who's the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. So, I wanted to set a little bit of the scene for this conversation and just offer some perspectives, and then I'll ask um, my panelists to say a few words about their organizations and make a, a provocative statement about this topic to help get us going. So this question of business role and uh, social agenda has been one that's been discussed for, for many, many years. And quite a while ago, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the perspective was very much that the role of business is to create shareholder value and maximize profits. And the social agenda was up to government and also civil society. Then the idea of corporate social responsibility started to gain traction. And this was the idea that corporations had a role to play in helping advance a social agenda. And they might play that role by financially making some contributions. So for example, supporting a local hospital or supporting a nonprofit or having some volunteer days uh, for their employees. More recently, the idea that's being talked about is one of shared value. And it is the idea that business can pursue the business objectives and also social objectives at the same time, just by virtue of their business model. So how can they think about packaging where they're reducing the amount of material for packaging to reduce the environmental footprint, but also save money? And how can they employ people from diverse backgrounds, which helps uh, reduce inequality, but that gives them more creative problem solving internally because they have different perspectives? And so this is a topic that's really been uh, gaining traction. And I think the question that's being put here at the open forum pushes it one level further, which is not only the question around can business pursue its uh, objectives, financial objectives, and also social objectives, but in fact, should business be leading the social agenda for these big challenges that we're facing around employment and climate change and sustainability, should business be actually stepping out in front and playing a leadership role? Uh, because the assumption under this question is that perhaps government and civil society and nonprofits aren't doing enough. So with that, what I'll ask is for each of my panelists in turn to tell a little bit about their organization so that we have a sense of the perspective that you're bringing to this conversation and then share a provocative perspective on this question. Danny? Okay, uh, good evening everyone. I'm Danny Sreeskandaraja. I'm Secretary General of Civicus, which is a a global association for civil society. We're a membership-based organization representing now civil society organizations, big and small, big non-governmental organizations and grassroots uh, activists in some 145 countries. So we're here almost as a sort of trade body for, for civil society. Uh, and I was very delighted to be invited to a, a conversation like this because I think when I, you know, I have the privilege of traveling and meeting activists all around the world. And what's becoming clear in the last year or so is that most of the people I speak to, particularly in the global south, uh, are coming to the realization that we just cannot carry on 
with business as usual. And I suppose my provocative statement for, to start things off would be that we shouldn't really be thinking about whether business as business stands should be leading the social agenda. We should be redefining all of our organizations so that everyone is obliged to respect the social agenda, and I would go further, the environmental agenda, that anyone who pursues profit alone without bearing in mind the social and environmental impact of what they do um, should not be tolerated. And if we don't do that quickly, we will not achieve a sustainable planet, uh, let alone address the deepening inequality that's out there. Thanks, Danny. Ashidi? Great. Um, so thank you very much for the warm welcome here in Davos. This is my first time here. I feel very, uh, very at home. So uh, thank you all. Um, I run a company called Sproxel, which empowers consumers to uh, avoid buying counterfeit products. Every year, there's about $200 billion of counterfeit pharmaceuticals sold every year. And uh, if you extend that to agrochemicals and uh, luxury goods, it's about $600 billion uh, sold, which goes into the pockets of uh, criminals who use it to fund uh, crime. Uh, so the way we've solved this, uh, the problem in uh, some key emerging markets is to empower consumers to verify the products at the point of sale uh, so that they can avoid purchasing the counterfeit products, which in turn uh, defunds the uh, organizations that uh, benefit from, from these uh, illicit activities. Uh, we've been able to serialize uh, half a billion products with seven million users in six countries. Uh, my take on this, on this issue is that um, if you wait too long for the court of public opinion to um, deem that corporations are not doing enough, you're already too late uh, to uh, take action on, on the situation. And businesses put themselves at risk for uh, government intervention uh, and additional regulation or laws and stipulations uh, to try and, and re, uh, readjust or correct the, uh, the, the belief in, in the uh, business's position in society. Um, so I think that even though businesses, in my opinion, should not lead the, uh, the agenda because businesses uh, specialize in, in creating uh, value for their shareholders and society, uh, they should be very strong collaborators with uh, the specialists like uh, governments and civil society who do look at social issues uh, more on a, a long-term basis. Thank you. Paul? I'm uh, Paul Bullock. I'm uh, uh, from Nestle. Nestle is, uh, well, quite well known in Switzerland. Uh, it's quite a sizable company. We, we, we are all together almost 350,000 people in the world. We, we do have uh, quite a sizable presence, 470 factories in the world. We, we are almost in 160 countries. So um, and, uh, we see different realities. Now, on, on that question specifically, is, uh, should business uh, lead the social um, agenda? I, I would say very clearly no. It should not lead the agenda, but it should definitely be part of it. And, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's a nuance that is, uh, that's very important. Uh, we heard already uh, the, the, the question about should companies do what they have to do, which is maximizing shareholder value. I definitely would say no. It should create shared value, and you have mentioned that too. Shared value is actually going back uh, to the fundamental role of economical activity which is, in society, economical activity should create value for all stakeholders. One of them is shareholders. And when a company like Nestle goes about its program and its activity in the longer term perspective with something that is fundamental, which is respect, I think then whatever it does will also create value for society at large. And that is the way what I feel companies or the economical activity per se should be part of society and not lead the agenda, but definitely be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, DSM is a company which has two types of businesses. One is we are the largest food and nutritional ingredient provider in the world. And the other one is a materials business where we have developed new materials to reduce the impact of climate change by making cars lighter, new forms of energy, and those kind of things. And climate and food are not unrelated areas. They have a lot to do with each other. Our philosophy um, is that companies should work indeed for all stakeholders, like Paul Bilke was also saying, and we have our own terminology here, and we have a triple bottom line. 
people, planet, profit. And we measure also whether we contribute enough to profit, our economical performance, because we need to take care of that, because nobody is bringing every Friday afternoon a truckload of money, so we need to earn it ourselves. But also, we have a bottom line in terms of our contribution to the planet, whether we leave the planet in the right stage for next generations, and whether we provide enough value for society. So people, planet, profit. And it's not that planet and people are additional goals. No, those are three prime goals for the company. Issue, what I see is normally in society, we value companies, especially on the economic performance. And we look a little bit lesser to their performance on the people and planet dimension. And the question is whether that is correct, and I don't think so. Thank you. The United Nations Development Program is a, a major program in its own right and also the agency in the UN that, that leads all the other agencies that in some way contribute uh, to uh, development. Uh, we are mandated uh, to work with developing countries to achieve sustainable development, uh, to pursue economic and social progress uh, for people within the boundaries of nature. And with the uh, upcoming Sustainable Development Goals, which will form the global development agenda for the next 15 years, uh, when pronounced uh, later this year, uh, there's a lot of work to do to, to move towards the so Sustainable Development Agenda. So then we come to, well, what about the, the role of business? Well, business is part of society, and you can't move towards and achieve sustainable development without business playing its part. And some of the more satisfying work we've been involved uh, with in the last couple of years has been working, for example, with the business leaders who want to commit to take deforestation out of their supply chains. And we're getting very, very big commitments around that now for action. Uh, from those who uh, buy most of the world's palm oil. Palm oil has been uh, a commodity which has been really responsible for a lot of forest destruction, but we're in the course, I think, of getting the commitments that will stop that. And discussion here at this Davos is now about, well, how do we extend that to talking to the people who, who buy the, the soybeans, uh, who, who buy the beef? You know, how many more commodities can we get on that uh, kind of track where they don't uh, buy from deforested land and could be part of uh, keeping our forests for all the reasons of biodiversity, maintenance, and uh, climate change mitigation? So that's uh, just some thoughts to start the discussion off. Thank you, thank you. So a wide range of perspectives. Let me direct a first question, perhaps, uh, Paul and Feka to you as CEOs of large companies. Uh, Paul, you mentioned that uh, there's an uh, obligation or a, uh, the physics of business is around creating economic value and it should create value for all stakeholders. Um, but one of the challenges, I think, uh, the way the current system works is that a lot of the revenues and benefits are captured by the corporation, but in many cases, the costs are borne by a wider set of people. So in the case where companies are making trade-offs between burning cheap oil and there's a carbon that gets produced and the cost is borne by the entire planet versus a higher cost solar solution uh, where there is no cost to society, but the cost of the business is higher. So I'm curious about your perspective of this imbalance between who is capturing the benefits and who is bearing the costs. And is it possible for companies to self-regulate so that there's a neutral trade-off? Uh, or does government need to step in and reset some of the policies or regulations? What is your take on that? But again, um, companies are a part of a society and the awareness of issues is also maturing over time. And and companies should take up their uh, responsibility linked with that awareness. And I think um, a company, whatever company it is, when that company goes really with that dimension of longer term perspective on things and, 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 and has, has that dimension that I call culture, but culture, what is culture? It, it is fundamentally respect, respect for, for, for the, the environment, respect for the future, respect for etc. Then I think, uh, uh, and we want to be around in 150 years. We are almost 150 years old. We, we, want, we want to be around in 150 years. Well, then you go and with a totally different mindset about your activities. It's not, we don't want to be, as a company, for example, when we, when we engage in a country, we, we, we don't want to be a hit and run 
uh, presence. Uh, just uh, take what you can and uh, run away with it. Uh, also, be because if you see the fundamental, uh, uh, Nestle is a food and beverage company that is linked with raw materials that are linked with agriculture. Agriculture is a is something that evolves over time. You can you cannot go in there and 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 have a factory and and then leave it. Uh, and that is a little bit what is li linked with our DNA. Your long term commitments with societies you're in. Uh, when, when we start a factory that is uh, uh, producing milk, you need farmers. You need long-term relationships. You need respect. You need to, con to condition also uh, uh, ingredients like water. Uh, and you have seen that we have been quite explicit on water. So in other words, I, I feel if you as a company are, are just part of society with that uh, way of seeing things, that a shareholder value is only one of the values you create, it is an important one. But this is only retributing to one stakeholder. And there's so many others, your employees your farmers, your society, our consumers. It just makes sense. Actually, the nice dimension of creating shared value is you are trying to link up with society in a positive way, um, and, and it makes business sense. And actually, I, when I studied at university or uh, economical activity, we had moral philosophy of the economy. And actually, the, we say we should reinvent uh, uh, the industry. We should reinvent economical activity. We should not reinvent. We should go back to basics. Economical activity in society is actually relating resources with outcomes that are positive for society. If not, there is no value in that equation, and do that as efficient as possible. Well, that's economical activity. That's definitely, as a definition, inducing, uh, creating shared value. And I think that perspective is something that, that you see also here in Davos, you hear a lot of that multi-stakeholder engagement and all, it's all there. It's all there. And I think uh, we have to be more vocal on that. Now, you still do a lot of activities. You still can be criticized. And we are, and rightly so. And we should listen and, and learn and see. That's why I say also, if we learn certain dimensions that are affecting certain parts of society that we didn't know before, we should adapt. We should have an open ear. We should not go in defensive mode. We should go in positive listening mode and see what we do together as a society. Yet at the same time, too, as a company or whatever, uh, criticized and being the only, and being accused as being the only part of the problem, I feel we should also push back and say, no, we have our, we have our part to share on it, but let's engage positively to see how we give a solution to that. Um, I think that's the best balanced way. It's another way of creating shared value. Another way of creating shared value is us sitting here and talking about that, you see, to, to, to help to shape mindsets that are uh, more positive together. And Fekke, how about your take? Yeah, you're right. There are issues in the world. Um, there's hunger. There's almost a billion people who go to bed hungry every day. There are issues in the world around climate change. And like Paul is saying, it is not that society is there and companies are here and look to society. No, companies form an integral part of society. So if there are problems in society, like climate change or hunger or whatever, we need to think, we need to be part of that, we are part of that problem or we are part of those, those issues automatically because we are part of society. And I think in the last 50 to 100 years, you see another change, uh, especially with bigger companies. They have an increased power because they have a global impact. 100 years ago, there was hardly any company which had a global big impact. Now you see companies who can have that. Sometimes not good, sometimes very good. And I think if you have more and more impact, you should show more and more responsibility as well. That counts for us as leaders also. If we have more impact in our company, we better be very responsible people in our company because we can influence uh, a lot of things. And as we do in our company, we support very much the World Food Program of the United Nations. We gave all our patents, all our technologies for free to them to use that, not to resell it, then we are out of business. But for those who need that, they can use it. And people ask me often then, ah, why are you doing that? What's in for you? I said, that's our responsibility. We are the biggest in nutritional ingredients in the world. We see a, people, a lot of people with problems we think it's our responsibility, it's our obligation to contribute to that. 
Yeah, but are you secretly making money? No, we are not secretly making money out of that. This is good for society, we should do that. This afternoon, I was leading a session with 35 CEOs of companies who said, we want to take a step forward on climate change. We want that carbon is being uh, getting a price, tax, so, um, so you want, but I uh, prefer the word uh, carbon pricing. And we hope that governmental leaders will make a deal about that in December 2015, when we have a big climate conference in Paris. So business leaders want that. Appreciate it. Uh, to all those business leaders who in yeah. fact say, we create a fertile ground where you, policymakers, can take decisions. And indeed, Paul was saying it also. I, I don't think that companies should lead the social agenda. Companies do not have the right to make laws. And rightly so. Companies do not have the right to regulate things. And rightly so. But companies can influence governments by saying, if you go a step forward, we are totally behind you. We even stimulate you to go a step forward and to give a price to carbon because that will help the world to transition. Often people ask indeed, why are people doing that? And I give a simple explanation. It is not that after high school, all the good people with a heart start working for NGOs or governments. And that all the bad people went working for companies. Life is much more complicated than that. <laughs> so there are very good people in business as well. And they like to improve society and to make the world a better world. As simple as that. Well, Fakey, I started in business and now work at a foundation, so maybe I'm getting better in my age uh, <laughs> as I progress. So those were great perspectives. And now maybe I can ask um, Dananjayan and Helen for you to maybe respond to these perspectives, because you're not businesses, but you're thinking a lot about the role of businesses. What is it that you heard that you find very encouraging, what you disagree with, what you feel was missing? I'd very much enjoy hearing your perspectives on this. Why don't you go ahead, okay. Danny? Uh, I mean, just to come, come back to this last point about, about good people in business. There are, I agree with you. There are some fantastic, uh, inspirational leaders in business. Um, one of my favorite, many of you will know, is Paul Pullman, who works at Unilever, who leads, the, um, who leads Unilever. And on sustainable development, um, Pullman is, has been you know, at almost every meeting uh, leading this agenda. But I worry about that, because I think some of us have caught what I call pulmonitis, which is this belief that everyone, <laughs> you've got pulmonitis. No, I don't have it. <laughs> I always say some do the talking, others do the doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so for me, pulmonitis is this sense that these you know, inspirational business leaders are going to save our world. And I wish that were going to be the case. But unfortunately, the reality is that there aren't enough businesses or business leaders who are doing enough uh, to protect people and planet. And we do need um, you know, clever regulation, clever incentives set by states who have clear objectives uh, that need to regulate what's going on. Because you know, every time I hear about uh, the sort of positive stories, and I, I believe what you're saying about what you're doing, I remember the headlines that we've seen just recently about tax avoidance or tax evasion by Google or Amazon or, um, um, or Starbucks. And in fact, just last night here at, at Davos, um, so although I'm civil society, I get invited to lots of the receptions, and I met a young man who'd flown in from the US. He manages a hedge fund, and he came to, to Davos last night, and he was enjoying himself, and I said, what are you doing? And he goes, well, on my way home, I need to stop in Guernsey. Uh, now, as many of you will know, Guernsey is a small island south of, of England, uh, which is notorious for having very lax tax conditions. And I said, what are you doing in Guernsey? And he says, I just need to stop there once a year to have my board meeting because my, my hedge fund is registered in Guernsey. So here we have the contradiction of, of, of the fact that we have rampant capitalism where too many actors are still pursuing profit 
at almost every cost, taking every possible route to maximize that profit or that shareholder value. And so we need to change fundamentally, I think, uh, the nature of, of how we think about business. Uh, and, and I think both of our business leaders here have, have reminded us how we should start thinking about that. You know, we have to integrate that triple bottom line, for example, in the very way that we, we structure and legitimize business operations in, uh, in society. Thanks, Holly. I think the, the, the business leadership on the issues within the business community is very, very important because not all business obviously thinks the way that the uh, more enlightened leaders we tend to see at, at uh, Davos or in association with the Global Compact of the UN. You know, there's, a, there's a, you know, quite a, an undertow of business that needs to be brought along by the people who, who do get it and do see the shared value and do see the role of business and society as needing to you know, be going with the big agendas and trying to meet uh, good, good objectives. Uh, but I also take the view that uh, you can do business in a way that is good for the business and good for the bottom line, but it's good for society as well. And indeed, not to do that can, in the end, be very damaging to the business. And if you just think of, of some of the uh, examples where you have uh, ethical and more aware consumers who want to buy things that they, they feel good about buying. They don't want to buy, for example, clothing and then hear that it was made in the factory that just got burnt down and, and burnt, uh, tragically, workers in a factory in, in, in Bangladesh. Uh, they don't want to hear that they, they bought their soap from a company that was quite happy to get it off newly deforested land uh, and because of the, the problems that's causing for our climate and biodiversity. So I think uh, pragmatic business uh, that gets with it and sees that uh, consumers are changing, they're more aware, they're concerned about the state of the world, and, and try to be part of the change that we all, all want to see, I, I think that that's very, very positive. So it can be a win-win. Thank you. And Ashifi, I want to give you uh, one final question before we open up to the floor. Um, uh, you're starting a relatively new organization, so in some ways you have a, a fresh slate to do things as opposed to some of the bigger and uh, corporations who have a longer tradition of how they operate. What are some of the things that you're thinking about that you want to do differently now that you can start a company and uh, start it off in a certain way and hope to see it grow in a certain way? Sure, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we are a five-year-old company, so uh, we're toddlers in, in the eyes of Paul, uh, but we're, we're growing quite, uh, quite rapidly. And, and one of the things that we uh, initially uh, decided to do when we're dealing with the issue of counterfeiting is if you look at the statistics, the market opportunity is actually larger uh, in the areas that we uh, initially did not prioritize. We went after the emerging markets in Africa and Asia where people were uh, getting uh, harmed by these counterfeit products and built a business, a profitable business, because we're a for-profit entity in those markets, right? We effectively picked the hardest question on the exam and decided to solve that one first. And then based on that, we're now expanding into new markets where the impact to consumers is, is not as uh, devastating as counterfeit pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we're seeing great progress there. But we've already earned the trust of the governments that we work with in the six countries that we do, uh, and also the consumers who use our services to avoid harm. And, and so there are a number of shortcuts in, in today's world of uh, you know, quick quarterly reports and uh, updates, and even us consumers are always tweeting, which I'm glad to see uh, there are not that many people on your phones here paying attention, that's good. Um, we see lots and lots of pressure to deliver quick results. And sometimes slow is better. And companies that have 150 years under their belt can go out with inspirational leaders and say, this is the direction we're going to take because there's 150 years of performance that can inspire trust. Uh, some of the companies you mentioned are younger companies. They don't have that track record that they can use as a basis to make these hard choices to go in and compete uh, based on the value that they deliver to society and not necessarily just the value that they deliver to their shareholders. Um, so I think the more and more we have such discussions, the Global Agenda Council at uh, the World Economic Forum, for instance, uh, is embarking on a, a project to try and get uh, more polls and more figures in, in, uh, in the mainstream corporate culture uh, so that in perhaps five, ten years we will uh, run out of room 
to uh, host the uh, major CEOs who are creating social change. If you, if you allow me a, a comment, and you, you mentioned the word, the, the word trust, uh, and you hear it more and more, trust that it is so fundamental, and, and actually it is linked with, with the uncertainty that we feel also uh, uh, that, that we live with, with the things happening in so many parts of the world. Now, uh, I, I, I want to make a comment that goes against my comment in the sense that you, and you come in Davos and you hear all these companies and you hear like me talking about what we all do well and um, we have to watch out that we don't go to the honey sweet talk in the sense of talking and we're living in a society where you have different angles and you, you have different interests and you have different, you understand? So you, you, Nirvana and trying to 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 show or to transmit nirvana like uh, is is false. I think we have to be honest too, and 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 there are issues, and there are uh, dimensions like um, I comply with the law. Yeah, but then you have the moral dimension coming in, and the moral dimension has is quite variable for, uh, depending on on angles, and and there are different. Uh, uh, um, the diversity in the world, different things, and, and that's the nicety about the world we're living in, yet at the same time it has, it entails some tension. And I think uh, the most important thing is that we are in dialogue together, co uh, co communicating, connecting, discussing, have an ear to each other, and, and that is what, what, what actually companies should do. And, and maybe we failed a little bit in the past of, of saying we do the things we think we have to do, and uh, we don't have to connect because we are autosufficient in our self-belief. And I think that has changed a lot. But at the same time, other parts of society, NGOs, uh, have changed too. And instead of having that, that tension, uh, we see more engagement. Engagement entails risk because you lose your age to a certain extent as an NGO. You may lose your age as a company you have still to stay true and honest towards what you're in for as part of society. But I think uh, 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 we've moved quite a little bit uh, in, in that sense. And, and that's what, what I feel overall is. That's where leadership comes in. Uh, leadership is, is, is like a bicycle. It is only in balance when it moves. And, and, and it is dynamic mm -hmm. in the discussion. Society is getting a, a new renewed angles to certain things. Environment. Palm oil is an issue that really popped up on the scene, uh, uh, was not so visible, although it was happening. And then we have to engage and act upon that and, and, and see the, 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 what's at stake, you see? And, and that's the dynamic of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we should not try to, to all go to the middle. There's no space enough there. And, and society is not like that, never gonna be. But let's be at least part of a society that engages and discusses and listens. Um, and um, uh, so that's a little bit as a counterweight because when we have the mic, we say all the, the good things we yep. do, and we do quite a lot of good things. So I could continue talking, and I'm not going to do it. Thank you, Paul. And you've already started the debate with yourself, and we'll try and open it up more broadly <laughs> as well. Um, you know, just from our perspective as a foundation, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has been around for about 100 years, and we try and work with corporations and government and civil society to get change to happen. And it's very interesting because we find ourselves in a situation where we're accused of helping large corporations make money. We get accused uh, by corporations of attacking them and criticizing them when they're not bad people. And and then uh, civil society and the nonprofits just want us to give them money and get out of the way. Uh, so we see it from multiple angles too. But now I'd really like to see it from a broader set of perspectives and we'd like to open it up uh, for questions. And uh, what would be helpful is if you could keep your questions, um, aim for actual questions. If you want to make a comment, please just make it brief. Uh, and I'll try and take two or three uh, questions at a time and then we'll have discussion on the stage. So I saw a gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando Morales de la Cruz. I was born in Guatemala, which is a coffee-producing nation, and a country where, unfortunately, Mrs. Clark still has great challenges because educational and health indicators are terrible. But I'm very pleased to hear uh, the CEO of Nestle talking about shared value. And my concrete question is about your Nespresso product, which is extremely successful. You have capsules selling at 37 cent 
euro, for example, in Europe. Of course, 50 rappen in Switzerland, but let's use euro because most people understand 50 cents, 50 rappen in Switzerland. But talking about shared value, how much of that Nespresso capsule actually goes to the coffee farmers? And how much of that Nespresso capsule is actually profit margin? Because if share value is the policy of Nestle, actually we should see it in every Nespresso capsule, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a question. Maybe we'll take two more questions and then come back to that. A question in the back. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Benjamin, Benjamin Schaaf from Germany. I have one personal question to Paul also. Um, Nestle is one of the very biggest companies in the world. Um, as a CEO of Nestle, I believe you are one of the top 100 businessmen in the world. Uh, I believe your job is very stressful, very interesting, but also very exhaustive. For such a job, I presume you need to have a driving force, your personal driving force, your motivation. I would love to know what is your personal driving force and how do you balance your motivation against shareholder value? Thank you. Okay, and maybe one more question. There's a woman up here in the front. Uh, hello, so uh, you were saying that business should not lead the social agenda, but should step up and participate and trigger change where they can do it. And the business cannot make laws, but they can influence lawmaking and again, trigger change where it's possible. So, I wonder what for you actually means uh, leading social agenda, if not making change, and who should do this, in your opinion? Okay, great. So a great set of questions. And you know, there was one question which uh, about the Nespresso's, but I think it's really about how is profit shared across all of the, the people in the supply chain. Uh, and then I think there was a question that would be interesting to hear from many people about what is your personal motivation as a leader uh, in leading the organization? Uh, and then the question of if not business, then who should be leading the social agenda? I, I think the, um, the question about Nespresso is to, is to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless anyone else okay. makes Nespresso, then <laughs> probably. I really hope you enjoy Nespresso sometimes, and uh, <laughs> it used to be a partner. So, uh, but look, um, uh, Nespresso is, is is we enjoy Nespresso. Uh, I must say, uh, it's a good it's it's a good platform and good product. Uh, we get a lot of good feedback. Uh, it's actually something that uh, is one of these creating shared values examples. Although your question was to try to to show a little bit the the, the other side of it. Think about it, that uh, Nespresso is a success uh, today. It's 25, 30 years old that, that we started with something that is a, a product that is new, and now it is linked with uh, um, quite a thousands and thousands of coffee farmers who are in the AAA Nespresso uh, project that you, that you know all the details about, which is really seeing how, uh, how we involve also the upstream people in there. And, and why is that? Well, Nespresso uses a quite a very, very narrow selection of beans. Actually, we turn each bean because we want to have that quality that then is to a certain extent expressed in price. The, the, the average price that we pay for our coffee is something like 30, 40 percent above uh, the market price because that's quite high quality selective. And we have quite a lot of uh, agronomes working with these farmers to, uh, to help to increase their yield, their quality and their better stable income. That goes beyond that, and I feel this is this is shared value. We do that for coffee in general. We have Nescafe, and we do that for coffee in general. We buy quite a sizable part of the coffee in the world, so we have a little bit of responsibility there. And so we, we are going with it's just like we do with milk farmers. And again, you say is that philanthropy? No. This is just it, for us. It makes sense when you see our longer-term relationship with our, uh, with our suppliers. We would not have a healthy business if, if we just uh, exploit and, and say, look, only my part is interesting. I, I, we engage with them, and it makes sense. And it allows us to, to go about a very interesting business like, like uh, coffee uh, or like Nespresso. Now, your other question, how about, um, uh, no, not your question, the other question about
Look, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you, the, the question, because you, have, you didn't have me, the question is how much, uh, how much margin, how much sense. We don't give that all away because then uh, my competition uses that against me and life is already difficult enough. I can tell you, I can only tell you that, 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 uh, that no, no, wait, wait, uh, wait, wait. Um, Nespresso has quite a lot of competition, quite a lot. So we're part of that, and there is a dynamic, and you don't have a free lunch just like that. I think what we have is a margin that allows us to continue investing in, in, in the system and the quality of the coffee. So I think it's a balance. You cannot overdo it. This is short term. And you see, we have a lot of competition that keeps us in check. So Paul, let me pick up on that and uh, turn to the leadership question, actually, because the idea of competition uh, poses a challenge to you, I think, as leaders in terms of who is morally self-regulating as a leader, and does that put you at a competitive disadvantage? I'd be curious for any perspectives on that. That's a general question. I would say uh, competition, but competition, you, 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 have, you have rules, and, 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 and we play with the rules, so we, we comply. You see, we, we have actually uh, two layers to get to uh, creating shared value. The first one is compliance. You cannot fool around with. And you comply first with yourself, and then comply with the external dimensions to it. The other one is sustainability, because we want to be around 150 years. And you cannot fool around with that either. You cannot cut, uh, uh, cut corners. And then you, when you have these two conditions, you speak about creative shared value. And, and we should be able, as a company, to compete effectively with these values. I, I feel uh, we should be able to invest in R&D and have insights and knowledge. We should be able to have long-term relationship with our suppliers and, and do it the right way and be successful. And, and I, I, I think Nestle is quite successful over time, has been 150 years uh, doing that. So I don't see one is conditioning the other. And if we cannot be in a, in a, in, in a product uh, and not be competitive, we should not be in there. Mm -hmm. And that's... And, and Hal, <coughs> let me turn to the last question now, which is around, so if not business, who should be leading the agenda? And if you think of the sustainable development goals, the post-2015 mm -hmm. agenda, who should be leading uh, the charge in terms of realizing those goals? Well, I think leadership has, has many, many layers and, and should be sought across the whole society. Uh, clearly to get a you know, decent outcome to the big political processes this year, which is the climate treaty in Paris, uh, which needs to be a meaningful one that actually sees some real progress towards keeping global warming under, under two degrees Celsius. Uh, leadership on getting a decent outcome at the Sustainable Development Summit. Uh, leadership at the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa, leadership uh, in March at the big conference on disaster risk reduction. Yes, you need political leaders, uh, government leaders stepping up on that, but you also need businesses to play its part, the civil society, the professions. I think leadership is to be found in, in many, many places. Uh, and the skills tend to be quite generic, actually, across the, the, the different sectors. I mean, if I was just to say a word about the sustainable development agenda, which is a much bigger agenda than the Millennium Development Goal one, you could characterise the Millennium Development Goal agenda as being, in essence, an agenda about tackling poverty, which is a critical issue, financed by official development assistance. But when you go from that to a much more transformational agenda about how you achieve sustainable development, sustainable development is about the way we live, it's about the way we produce, it's about the way we consume. So you start to talk about how do you, how do you finance such an agenda, well, it's, it's all hands to the wheel, isn't it? Uh, and inevitably, because it is about how we live, produce, consume, uh, you need the change and the transformation within business as to how it operates for uh, sustainable uh, development too. So I, I think these are exciting times and need leadership across the board. So Danny, your organization is around strengthening the voice of civil society, which in some ways implies that you're trying to resist the leadership of the other sectors, perhaps government and, and the private sector. Would that be a fair characterization, or how do you see it? No, I think I, I see it as, and in fact, one of the things that motivates me about my job is that I think we're living in an era where citizen action is going to play an increasingly important role in driving social change. That 
you know, people are organizing and mobilizing in new and creative ways and, and bringing about huge disruption to the political systems of the world, but also, I think, increasingly to the eco economic systems of the world. And we're doing it in two ways, that we're, as citizens, we are putting pressure on our states to change their behaviors. And I hope that as citizens, we'll put pressure on our, our governments when they turn up to these meetings that Helen's talking about to be aspirational and to save our planet and fight climate change and fight poverty and inequality. And by the way, I hope some of you saw the snowmen all around town this week uh, for Action 2015, which is a campaign that we and many, many other organizations around the world are leading to push our leaders to, to change. So that's an example, I think, of positive citizen action, but also as consumers to to hold our businesses to account, to boycott where we think uh, things are not working. So in a way, I think it's a, you know, if you think of it as an as a ecosystem where you have citizens, the state, and business, that change, social change happens in the relationship between the three. Sometimes it's about the state putting in more effective regulations to ban pollution of one form mm -hmm. or another is a, is a good example. In other cases, it might be citizens putting a pressure on our states, uh, for example, to ban landmines, which we successfully did um, a few years Great. ago. Great. Feke, you wanted to say something, and we'll go back to the audience. Yeah, and I, I uh, already notified it to you that I wanted to respond, because I found the question of the lady on the second row intriguing, and I think it's the right question. And I think my first statement on who leads the social agenda is not precise enough. And her question triggered that. So I want to make it more precise. What I meant was, I think business is not leading the social agenda, which I now will correct. I think we are leading the social agenda, is due to your question, thank you, uh, that we are not in charge of the social agenda. We are not the boss of the social agenda. We cannot dictate any social agenda. And it should not be like that. That is what I meant with, we don't lead that. We are not in charge, we are not the boss, etc. But if leadership, and I think leadership is, to contribute or to take care that we move from A to B, and that is leadership, then we do lead the agenda. Because I put a lot of effort in that we change the things we do around climate change. And I think it's not going well in the world. And I think we are heating up unnecessary this planet much too much. And I think we are burning too much fossil resources. And I think we need to change that. And I think I'm not in charge of it, and I do not control it. But I think that we, myself, others, can lead us. And that is what we did this afternoon, by sitting there with 35 CEOs and said, we shall make a step forward, even when governmental leaders or United Nations or whoever is not yet ready, we go a step forward. Is that leading? That is leading. To contribute, to be interested, and to help that we move from A to B is leading. And in that sense, uh, I think, very correct uh, question. Uh, by the way, to a certain degree, you're all leading by being here this evening. All of you could also sit at home, uh, watch television, why to come here and to listen to a couple of people in Davos and, and CEOs, etc. Because you're interested in what's happening in society. You're interested in what people are saying. And by your questions, you're influencing people, like you just did. Um, is that leading also to a certain degree? It is. And therefore, I'm grateful that Wonderful. you spent the time here. So why don't we give more opportunity for leadership with some questions from the audience. So I just want to be sure I scan the back. And I'm not, there's a gentleman in the back. If you could stand up, actually, when you have a question, uh, that would be easiest for the people with the microphones to find you. Um, I would like to, to sit. My name is uh, Peter Müller. Uh, I have no uh, relation to uh, organization. Can I speak in German? Is this possible? Because uh, my English is not too, too good. Um, certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, I will be brief, uh, and I will have a question in the end. So you will interrupt me if, uh, should I speak too long, okay? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bulke spoke about 
the harmony uh, needed that uh, ends being productive at some time. He said one should not uh, talk about all contradictions, but he also said that it's good to speak about contradictions so that society can make a step forward. And I would like to pinpoint uh, one contradiction very briefly that I think is fundamental. It's the contradiction between uh, the capitalistic thought and paradigm which is selfish and only profit based and oriented on the one hand and on the other hand where one talks about the nice world of civil society and of uh, social affairs of democracy uh, that doesn't take place in corporations at all by the way these are two different worlds, basically, that um, are facing each other. I don't think uh, that uh, a good entrepreneur has any freedom of movement. Uh, a good entrepreneur simply has to use certain business rules to generate his profits. And I hope that I was able to show this contradiction. That is basically my question. Thanks. You did articulate the contradiction. So what I captured was the contradiction uh, between, on the one hand, uh, the corporate and the profit-seeking world, and on the other hand, what you called the civil society and the democratic world. Is that correct? OK, we, so we got the comment. Uh, is there another question from the audience right here up front? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Thierry. I'm a Senegalian MBA student. And my question is to DSM and Nestle. How do you convince your shareholders that uh, sustainability increases their, uh, the uh, the sh um, their share price? So the question is how does sustainability increase share price? Yeah, so how do they convince their shareholders? How do you convince the shareholders? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And another question, one more, and then we'll turn it back to discussion here. I see a question right up at the front. Thank you. My name is Adi Tolvain, and uh, I used to um, work in the investment industry. Uh, now I'm on Al Gore's Climate Reality Corps. Uh, uh, so this isn't a transition really from uh, bad to good. In my later years, uh, I was involved in sustainability, in, also in the investment industry. Um, and one of the uh, observations um, that I frequently made in advising investors uh, about uh, their portfolios and their retirement funds is um, they would they would be often be people like people from uh, Mr. Siskajara's organization, or they'd be uh, active in 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 in, in sustainability and. Uh, uh, climate and other social justice issues, but when we got down to discussing their retirement portfolios and uh, pointing out that there were companies there that were, were problems, they they didn't they didn't get the connection. Uh, and uh, and then on the other hand, I was meeting with um, innovative um, uh, uh, enter entrepreneurs who were introducing solar and other technology, and I had a great deal of difficulty finding people, including people who were often espousing certain social values and principles to actually put their money into these uh, these type of companies. So the question I, uh, the, 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 that I, I want to put to you is, is there, is there uh, in your view, more integrity among people uh, as we, as you're working in your organizations and your corporation, uh, that that people who have these values are actually, in a more integrated way, addressing them in all areas of their life, in terms of what they're buying, in terms of where they're investing, and how they're acting politically. And also, this question also goes to the political sphere, because we have a lot of politicians who are noticing that when the, the elections are held, the, the, it's not the sustainability is supporting green or whatever politicians are getting the votes of the people who are concerned with uh, terrorism and security and with immigration and these type of issues. And often these are experienced politicians who know 
uh, that the climate crisis is scientifically uh, almost totally proven, but the voters aren't getting it, so they're they're going after the votes of these 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 voters who uh, have these biases in order to get elections. So is it possible to get more integrity also into the political leadership, as well as into the uh, into the public into, into the public and the way that they live and the demands they make on corporations and politicians? Thank Great, you. thank you. So I think what we heard in that set of questions was really a theme of values. So one question or comment was around this perceived competition between two world views, and any thoughts on that? Uh, the question around how do you convince shareholders of the value of sustainability? And then this last question around, so what behaviors need to change, and where is there a difference between what people are saying and what people are doing? Anyone want to jump in? Thank you. Well, first of all, capitalism is that two different models, two different worlds, which are uh, sometimes conflicting, which is how you try to pinpoint a conflict about maybe building a better world or doing good for all people versus doing good for yourself in a selfish way in capitalism. Capitalism is based on competition also, that the best man will win, and competition itself is not bad. Go 30, 26 years back in China, uh, before Deng Xiaoping opened China, and you go for a haircut. It takes you more than an hour, more than one and a half hour, and I did it to get a haircut in Beijing. And you ask to the guy who's doing that, I, I don't want to hurry you, but why, why so slow? He said, I don't mind. Uh, I get the same pay during the whole day when I do three, five, or 10 people. Why should I hurry? I understand that. At a certain moment, China changed, and uh, a haircut is a little bit faster now than in one and a half hour. So competition in itself triggers, if you look to sport, competition itself triggers to be better, to try to new things, etc. So in itself, is that element of a capitalistic system not bad? If you overexpose it and become too selfish and forget all other things, or try to win, at the cost of everything, then it goes wrong. And here is the balance which should be there. Regulators play a role, but even more important, your own ethics and your own mindset plays a role. And building that to the question about sustainability, here it is the same. I think, I believe in it, that being a sustainable company at the longer end, at the long end, will be better for the world, will be better for our company, will be better for our shareholders. Are there moments that it is not the case on the short run? Absolutely. And people were interested in that. I said, don't invest in our company. Are we even doing things which I hardly can calculate? What is the benefit of our company? We had one time and at the shareholders meeting, people say, why are you spending all those money with the World Food Program? What is it delivering for shareholders? Nothing in the coming years. I said, I agree. Please, the shareholders said. You agree that in the coming years this is not giving returns to you? I said, I agree. So why are you doing that? I said, I believe we have the responsibility. And he said, well, I'm a shareholder. I don't like it. I said, maybe you should not be a shareholder of our company because I think it's good that we do those kinds of things. And please, you can go somewhere else as well. This is what we do as a company. And I think we should do this as a company. The benefit, I said, I see, is that we have a very high engagement of our own people, and they are very motivated that they work for such a company. I cannot prove it, but at the end of the day, that will create failure for a lot of people as well. But Wonderful. <laughs> Danny and then Ashifi. But you see, uh, this, this discussion about capitalism and civil society, capitalism, uh, where, when, you only, when you only retribute to money, that's not what capitalism stands for. Capitalism stands for resources. Now, if you narrow it down to money, then you're totally right. That doesn't work. And I think we should go back to the basic of what you have been saying. It is this, this well, what's inside the hu human being. It is to be better tomorrow and, and to go for something, to learn, to investigate, to more, know more. That dynamic in society is a positive thing. And, and actually, that is what has been the driver of society and brought us where we are. There's many things to be done still but it has brought us forward as a, as a society. And shareholder, uh, the shareholder value, per se, 
uh, we get more and more shareholders saying, you have to go about sustainability before I get to you. And so we, we are part of society there too. Uh, we, we privilege shareholders that are thinking and are in our company for the long term. And uh, the ones who want to have a very short uh, term deal with us, normally with Nestle, they're not well served. Great, and Danny Nashifi, I think you wanted to comment? Sure. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, given the open forum is to help set expectations, is that sometimes the public's view is that um, the corporation should perhaps even make a loss uh, in favor of, say, the, the farmer and so on down the supply chain. That uh, inherently uh, goes against the uh, purpose of corporations, which is to deliver value to a broad uh, number of stakeholders within society. Um, so with companies that have supply chains where value is provided, it's important to look at the entire bundle of value and not just the money that is sent down to the supply chain. Uh, we have several examples of in the nonprofit world, you know, parachuting in money, and that doesn't actually solve the problem. The goal is to increase the dignity with which the people live. So if corporations, uh, the, the CEO of Heineken gave a great example, uh, are training farmers to improve their yield, farmers started yielding so much crop that Heineken couldn't buy all of it. And so now they had extra to go sell at the marketplace, which would not be reflected in how much margin trickles down to the farmer, but would be reflected in an increase in the dignity with which they carry themselves in society. So let's uh, have a bit more realistic uh, sense of the compromise between the expectations of society and the, the purposes of, of corporations which is to return the value to the broader stakeholders. I want to just go back to what I understood from Peter's uh, observation. I think that uh, we would make a big mistake if we think that society is going to be stuck in, in these sectors, that there will be these businesses out to make profit, and even civil society out to make positive social change. What I see is already happening is what might be called hybridization. I hope that translates well in German. That there's shape shifting. Um, so for example, in my sector, we have huge NGOs. I mean, there are, there are leaders in Davos here who run organizations with more than $1 billion turnovers. And these are registered non-governmental organizations. And so, or if you take the context like you talk about Nigeria, in Nigeria, NGOs spend more money on providing water and sanitation services than the government does. So, you know, we're starting to see even civil society playing a slightly different role. But I've already made the point that businesses them themselves are starting to change. So I think, I suspect you think of yourself as a social entrepreneur, not just as an entrepreneur. And even the formations are starting to change. So we have social enterprises. In America, there are these things called B corporations or low profit um, uh, limited liability companies. So we're starting to see a hybridization where I think we have to act quickly is to bring the, the sort of the bad guys, to use Ficker's uh, uh, analogy, closer to the middle so that they too are thinking about the social agenda and not just maximizing the money they take home. If, if, if I may react re really quickly, I think um, it's important to uh, think about high profits uh, and high value in, in different spheres, right? By being a social enterprise doesn't mean necessarily you have to make a loss or you have to make low profits, right? And I think if society puts corporations in that box, we would not have an outcome where corporations would feel uh, the, they have the latitude to return value to society. Because you're competing, right? A lot of the corporations that compete with Nestle perhaps are not having such discussions, but Nestle has to compete with those corporations on the shelf in the, in the store. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to participate, you have to have the latitude that other companies have and then make the choice to go on a more sustainable route. And if society gives corporations that latitude and leaders step up and make the right choice, then I believe we'll, we'll have a solution. If you get boxed into having low profits, uh, that is, is fairly unattractive. Uh, Helen, to I'm curious on your perspective, uh, if we are to be successful with the sustainable development goals, what values have to change most? Well, I, I was reflecting on this question around what, what's the motivation for businesses to do these things, and you know, perhaps 
sometimes people being cynical and saying, well, why are they doing it? Uh, I actually think that for any unit of society, whether it's the individual, the organisation, the, the company, whatever, reputation matters. And reputation is built on integrity and values that are perceived to be, be good. And it's, it's built on engagement, engagement with things that are seen to be, to be uh, positive. Uh, so I think for, for a company, this issue of reputation, of being associated with, with things that, that are good things to do, like the World Food Programme is a good, a good thing to support. Uh, companies which are involved with uh, ethical ways of, of uh, producing their goods and services. Companies which, which treat their, their work as well. Uh, companies which stand for equal opportunity. It's, it's this issue of reputation. People feel better about doing business with a company that, that values its reputation and is engaged than they do about doing business with one which isn't. Wonderful, and thanks. Also, medically, yeah. what Helen, Helen said, that has to do with long-term commitment and long-term um, entrepreneurship as well. Yeah. Because nobody wants to deal with suppliers or customers uh, who you cannot trust and, and, and who exploit you. If I may add, I don't like the word social entrepreneurship. I don't like that at all. Why? Because does something exist as non-social entrepreneurship? I have not seen any entrepreneur, maybe they do it sometimes, but not as a goal, and say, well, we are an enterprise and we only care about ourselves. We try to exploit our people. We try to damage the planet and we want to make as much as much profit. And we think that that is a good concept. I think, <laughs> okay, I think that I, is I a live bad in, I live in New York and those people do exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well then, I, then, I make, then I make my point. Uh, it should not exist. So we should not say we distinct ourselves from main pack by social enterprises. I would say all enterprises are social enterprises. If not, you do not belong here. And if there are companies like that who you know, then uh, I would say please <laughs> get them out because we don't need it. Maybe arms manufacturers. Well, uh, so I'm the one here with the, the label social entrepreneur. So I, I feel like I may have to uh, uh, come to a defense here. But my view is that I absolutely agree that with, with Paul's view that if corporations are providing a whole comprehensive set of value back to multiple constituents in society, every corporation is a social uh, corporation or a socially uh, motivated one, right? But we do not have the case. But the, the term social entrepreneur helped a little bit to put some, some emphasis on certain dimensions that was sometimes forgotten. I don't believe yeah. you do have these entrepreneurs that you just described so, so vividly. Um, I don't think they're going to say it. Uh, that's, the, that's the difference. But the, 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 I think well-inspired, value-based entrepreneurship is per se social too. But having that term popping up has helped us to, to, to put us a, that awareness of how entrepreneurs and companies should be linked to society yeah. has put that a little bit in, the, in, mm -hmm. in light. And I think it has a positive thing. But um, I hope, yes, indeed, that all entrepreneurs and companies could be socially engaged in their role as being part of society. And that's, again, uh, being part of society, you're part of society. You, you, there's no such thing as... And that's a little bit the question about capitalism and civil society. I, I'm sorry. Uh, civil society is us all here. Me too. You. That, that's it. We're all part of that society. And that's why you cannot say, well, we are a society and you're out of it, uh, so we exclude you from society. Um, I, I never felt that, though. Uh, so there was a question about motivation. What motivates us? And, and I can tell you. I started my career with Nestle now quite a few years ago, 35 years ago. And I started in Peru. And that was exactly when there was this, this, this um, shining path uh, uh, that, that killed many, many people there. And, I can, and so we, many companies left. It was, was quite dangerous to be there. Um, they found uh, some of the young people like me to go there. But, but it was quite dangerous. <coughs> Nestle stayed. And other companies too, but many, many left. Nestle stayed to be part of that company, uh, that country, linked up with farmers, good times and bad times. Um, we have actually now today 4,000 people working for us in Pakistan. Now, I was there a few weeks ago. You should see 
Uh, the 99% of our people are from there, Pakistani, proud, working, and that's stabilizing. That's, that's what I say also. Is that social entrepreneurship? That's entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But that's engaging with a society in good and bad times. And I think that's, that, that is what companies should do. That is what economical activity should do. And we stay in these countries, and, and, and sometimes difficult to, uh, times. In Syria, we had a factory until last, the year before now, uh, 2013, a factory with 600 people working still, in spite of all. And they went to their job and they were proud until they blew up the factory. Uh, yeah, but we are still having 150 people in the payroll in Syria working. And, 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 and we, we are working, being part of that country, with people uh, organizing themselves, waking up in the morning, going to their job, because that is what gives them hope for their next generations. Now, we could also pull out. We don't, we don't earn money whatsoever in Syria, I can tell you. But you see, and, and, and yes, indeed, we are a grow, uh, uh, quite a sizable company. And yes, indeed, we may be criticized, and we're going to correct certain things. And we're still all 350,000 people, persons, but with their weaknesses and strengths. But you see, that's where that relationship between are you part of society or not? Well, if you live these situations, you feel pretty much part of a society, I can tell you. I think that's that makes point. me proud to be part of a company like that. You see, that's why that's motivating me. That keeps me going. Great point. Neb, we'll maybe take two more questions from the audience and then a quick round. Gentleman right over here. Um, hello, my name is Chacha Tsang, and um, I'm a little bit excited, so I wrote it down. Um, I'm sorry to return to the um, espresso question, because you talked about people who are proud, 99%, but um, and you told us that when you would told us the share about the capsules, the concurrents would criticize you, right? No, no, not criticized. They would use the information. Yeah, but against you, not for you. But that's the dynamic. It's like f football, you know? Uh, no, 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 no. You don't show all your cards before you start the game. I mean, uh, that's the nicety about it. And yeah, sure. But well, anyhow. My question, to be short, is if you were a farmer, would you be happy with the share? And the second question is, are they, like with the wage that they get, are they um, able to improve their farming skills and farming capabilities, cap cap capabilities and capacities. Yes, and yeah, stuff. Thank you. Great, thank you. So one more question right next to you there. Hi, uh, I'm a student as well, and I'm also very nervous talking to <laughs> such powerful people. Uh, well, my question was, while listening to you, a thought came to my mind. And it was whether comp uh, big companies or even countries could be scared of the fact that poor countries or where they get their resources from could rise to powerful nations or just become more influent in the world if they will pay them more for their resources. <laughs> Great. So I think, um, you know, again, a theme of, I think, fairness here of who is getting what share. Um, you know, if we were all to imagine ourselves as farmers, would we be happy with the situation? And then actually at a more global level, a question of trade between countries. So, and, and maybe we'll use this as an opportunity for final comments as well. Um, I'll just turn it to whoever wants to pick up this sort of theme of fairness with these two very good questions that were posed by the audience. Uh, let me talk about this, uh, the, this uh, the farmer, and we have coffee farmers, we have uh, milk farmers. We, uh, if we want to be in, uh, for, for the, uh, in the long term and be successful and all, you have to connect positively with society. You have to connect positively with your farmers. You cannot uh, exploit them, run away. You, they have alternatives. They have alternatives. They, and, and it is by working together with them that they have higher yields, more production, better quality, higher prices, and that they produce exactly the ingredients we're looking for. So uh, the, you, when you do that with the right mindset, there is, that is not exclusive, it is inclusive. 
And I think that's the important part of the equation. I, I, Mill Farm, same thing. I mean, we cannot, it's like our employees, we cannot outsmart them. We, 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 we have to make them part of it, positively. And I think we have 350,000 of them, but we have actually millions more that are linked with our activities, uh, uh, be it our, 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 our customers or our suppliers. Uh, we, we, we're working with 750,000 farmers directly. Great. Directly. Any quick um, thoughts or comments from the other panelists? I just wanted to um, reflect a little bit on the short-term, long-term thing, because that's, I think, all of us have said in different ways that one thing that's essential is to have the long-term view to achieve long-term social change. But I think wherever we look, our modern societies are all about the short-term. It's about the guy going to Guernsey to make sure he can make a short-term profit for his investors, or, or going back to shareholders every month or, or quarter or whatever else it is. And even in the NGO sector, we're not immune from this. We, we're trying to achieve long-term social change through one-year grants. And what sort of long-term social change can you achieve in a year? So I think all institutions in society need to start thinking about the long-term, and in particular this year, because it's going to be so pivotal around uh, you know, these sustainable development goals, where we have to set ourselves long-term targets and long-term commitments for changing the nature of, of how we approach poverty, climate change, mm -hmm. and inequality. And if we don't do that, none of us will achieve social Great. change that we need. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, I'll, I'll mention that um, from just the questions and the, the comments in the room, it sounds to me that there's a shared responsibility between corporations and uh, larger society, civil society governments to be able to create the environment that can actually address the situation, right? Society uh, needs to have uh, expectations that allow corporations to address the situation and get more and more social along the spectrum. Um, and then uh, corporations need to respond to that responsibility, that uh, the calling, as, as Faker was saying, to be more social, uh, speak up to shareholders who are looking for short-term return and say, this is right for the company, this is right for society, I believe in this, I am the leader. And if you do not agree, there are several stocks that you could put, park your, your money into. So let's acknowledge that there's a shared responsibility to address this problem, which affects society as a whole, including corporations. Thank you. Fake your help. Let me say it in one sentence, why we need to co uh, contribute to society and why we need to work on a better world. Because you cannot be successful, don't even call yourself successful in a world that fails. Just responding a little to the last question, which uh, posed, you know, would perhaps richer countries or people be uh, threatened by the fact that others who were poorer were, were coming up and becoming more powerful? Well, the, the whole purpose, I think, of development is to try and close the great gaps and inequities which have uh, been existing between people and, and between countries. And, and we do see now that convergence going on. If you compare growth rates in developed countries with those in, in emerging economies and, and developing economies, of course, the, the growth and momentum is, is with the, the countries who are developing, and, and a lot of those gaps are closing. But I think uh, another sub-theme of, of, of Davos is very much this issue of inequalities, that the people aren't benefiting equally from what's happening in societies and in the world. And in, the new global development agenda, we have to be very, very mindful of how corrosive inequality is. And in, in a way, it can be most corrosive when a country is going ahead, but some people are going ahead a lot faster than others. And uh, so uh, we're very, very much motivated in, in the UN not to leave anyone behind, but disproportionately to see the poorest countries and the poorest people uh, making gains and advances so that they can uh, fulfill their full potential as human beings and have dignity too. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Many, just a simple question has raised so many interesting uh, next generation questions of all these tensions that are in play of, you know, thinking more long term can help resolve some of these tensions, yet the market still operates on a short term. We have different sectors and it's best to think of the lines as not being so sharp or the boundaries as being so sharp, yet they do have different objectives. Um, and then there is this question of fairness of uh, what is the right split of value and does everyone benefit or are there some winners and losers and how do we wrestle with that tension? 
But I think one of the interesting uh, things about this open forum and this discussion is the healthiest thing to do is to have open discussion about these. And I know I learned a lot from all the questions that were asked, uh, the thoughtful questions that were asked by the audience and the very interesting insights from the panelists. And I hope uh, that this open forum does uh, symbolize the way that we need to have a conversation as we are experiencing transitions of how all the sectors want the same outcomes, have different thoughts of how to realize them, and then there probably, and there has to be, uh, as Faye mentioned, a solution to it. So I just want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank the audience uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you. You are a great audience. But lo let me also thank you, two people who really designed this, Salima and James. That they are probably hiding behind the stage there, but they did a great job because Absolutely. they designed this, all these six sessions. Thank Absolutely. you very much.